Thank you. Hello uh, again, I think it is. Um, most of you are in the tour. Um, just a, a couple of questions I had from a few people uh, after the tour was how I got interested in Vicke in the first place. Um, so I'll just very briefly explain. I was, I, I've always collected um, glass and I bought a piece of Vicke Lindstrand glass some years ago on eBay and I wanted to find out more about him and there wasn't a lot written about him so I started researching, came to Sweden uh, and I've been coming back ever since um, and that's all kind of uh, culminated in the book. Um, so today I'm just going to talk about uh, the kind of the years of Vicky's creative output, um, his uh, different kind of stages of his career and a little bit about his life. Um, so he was born in Gothenburg in 1904 and died in Smallland in 1983. Um, he was the youngest son of Oscar and Hannah Lindstrand and we have a row of Lindstrands here today which is fantastic. Um, uh, Slotsbergit in Lundby Parish of Hissingen Island in Bohus Len province in Gothenburg. Three brothers, Daniel, uh, who is a very well-known Swedish uh, artist, um, Raphael and Samuel. Um, I put this in uh, because the area of Gothenburg where Vicke grew up um, is a place where these Bronze Age rock carvings can be found. And they're a theme that pop up in Vicky's work um, throughout his career. So, um, you know, it just kind of illustrates as a young boy, he's interested in looking at these sorts of things. Uh, Vicky's family were musical. Um, they all were encouraged to learn a musical instrument. Um, and Vicky was uh, a very promising baritone singer and would sing at the Lundby Old Church in Gothenburg. Um, and at, at one time it was thought that his career would be in a kind of more musical direction, but that wasn't to be. Um, you saw the painting uh, from when he was 12 years old in the exhibition. He had studied bookbinding by the time he was 14 years of age. And he then enrolled at the Slöd Föreningen School um, in advertising illustration. Um, the 1920s is kind of where the creative career of Vicky starts. Um, this is a self-portrait of Vicky, which is probably from the 1930s, I think, late 20s, 1930s. He's got the same hairstyle that he has in some period advertising photos from uh, from Oroforce. Um, so he was an advertising and sign painter. Um, he then worked in illustration and cartoons for the Gothenburg Post and the Gothenburg Trade and Maritime Gazette. He did more studies at the Slöldföreningen School, but this time it was in um, art and that's where his kind of painting developed. It was not until 1928 that his career in glass would uh, take off when he met Simon Gatte at an exhibition in Jönköping. And after some kind of hesitation, he visited Oroforce. He didn't think they needed him there, but he eventually joined in 1928. Um, these are some uh, illustrations from his early career as a, um, an illustrator with uh, Gothenburg Post and other publications. And again, you know, as I was saying in the exhibition, they show the, the artistic um, promise of this, this, uh, this young man. And they also, for me, they kind of suggest similarities to some of the engravings that he used um, when he would later work with glass. His painting developed 
He took a keen interest in what was happening in the art world. This painting, which I haven't seen in real life, but um, it's very much uh, sort of tapping into 1920s um, French purism and cubism. And, you know, a very accomplished painting uh, for such a young artist. So starting at Orifice in 1928, he um, spent the first two years just learning about glass. So he didn't produce anything. He spent those years learning everything he could about glass, how glass sort of working happened, blowing, engraving, so that he was kind of ready to do something. He was hired by Orifice because the 1930s Stockholm exhibition was coming up and um, continued painting as his private pursuit. But it was really the 1930 Stockholm exhibition, which was the beginning of, I guess, modernism in lots of ways in Sweden and the Funke's architecture, um, where he had his debut as a glass artist. The glass was met with a mixed reception. It wasn't the glass that we now know as being typically Vicke. Um, they were these very simple forms, but um, with painted enamel decoration. And there were around 30 or 40 of these objects that were exhibited in Stockholm in 1930. But what they do show is the, um, his kind of talents as an illustrator. And if you think about the background that he'd come from as being an illustrator, and you know he's designing the forms for uh, the objects, and then applying his techniques as a as an illustrator and an artist to pictorial scenes on the glass. And then something else happened. The more he learned about the material that he was working with, the more creative he became. And one of the vases in the exhibition out there sort of hints at this. Um, uh, kind of undulating lines inside the, the vase. That one's the pearl diver from um, the early 30s. And then this one, which is the shark fighters, which is uh, another famous piece. It's a really exuberant piece of glass that is twisting and turning and using the thicknesses and undulations in the glass to suggest the movement of the water. And this is the beginning of Vicke uh, using the kind of the void, the inside of the glass and the form of the glass and the way that the illustration can be applied around the glass in a truly innovative way. He worked with st the kind of staple oriforce technique of Graal and injected again more exotic influences into the glass and these are um, scene of a bullfight over here, and this is a, you know, kind of using some African uh, imagery. But he also um, was part of the team that was responsible for the invention of the aerial technique, uh, where um, the glass is uh, blown, it's then cut, and then another layer of glass is um, applied over the top and the air that gets caught where it's been cut creates these um, trapped air bubbles. And uh, he, Edwin Erström, and one of the uh, glass blowers are credited as co-creators of this technique. Um, and it's a technique that um, Oriforce is world famous for. A few of the paintings that I didn't talk about necessarily in the exhibition out there, um, some of the nudes that he um, was doing from the 1930s. This one was painted in New York in 1939. Um, and of course, the, um, the happy boy over here. So, you know, in parallel with glass, there's this. 1939 was a big year for Vicke with the first of his glass sculptures. And if um, you think of the um, legend in glass sculpture here in Vecque, um, you can see the, the kind of beginnings of that idea with these plates of glass that are stacked on top of each other. Um, this one certainly wasn't as, 
adventurous as some of the ones that he did later on, um, but nonetheless the beginning of his interest in public sculpture. And you can see on the cover of the booklet from the um, Sweden's booklet, there, there's the um, fountain sitting in the pool outside the um, Swedish pavilion. So um, this is uh, what I was talking about in the exhibition about him starting to make contacts in America and starting to think about what he might do after leaving Oriflos. It's no secret that he had a fantastic relationship with Simon Gatte, but a not so good relationship with Edvard Hald. And um, uh, one of the reasons he left Oriflos was because of those kind of conflicts, along with financial um, issues. Needless to say, um, the World War II prevented him traveling to America. But nonetheless, these sketches, which I'd only ever heard about, but I saw up in Stockholm uh, for the first time uh, a couple of years ago, uh, are some sketches that, of some murals that he had intended for the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. So, um, you know, that might have sort of taken him on a very different trajectory if it had not been for the war. And up here you can see, again, some of these, um, you know, Bronze Age influences um, from his childhood popping up again in, in some of his artwork. The 1940s, um, you know, borders closed, he couldn't travel to America. He's faced with a dilemma, what will he do? Um, but being um, someone that's been described as, as an artist that would constantly reinvent himself, he did exactly that. He was involved in the war effort. He worked, he joined the Air Force and worked in their propaganda department in Bromma in Stockholm. He was involved in the 58 Carlson exhibition um, in 1940. And this is one of the promotional propaganda postcards for that exhibition, which he did the illustrations for. The photo is very famous. I'm sure you all know that from, from that campaign. Um, but, uh, and it was here that he um, made some important contacts. He was working under Torsten Lindforsch, who owned Lindforsch Publishing. Uh, Viveka Lindforsch was his daughter. She was writing a children's book. Vicky did the illustrations. He then got more illustrations for more children's books. He's working in textiles with Elsa Gulbag. Um, a huge range of uh, textile designs that as of yet, haven't been reintroduced back into the market like most of these textiles from that period have. But again, they, they show th themes that were popular at the time, um, a tremendous understanding of pattern and how to apply illustration to repeat patterns because fabrics obviously um, require that, that sort of skill. And just an incredible range of themes, you know, this one sort of harking to his time in New York. But when I look at these things, um, we look at this, um, you, you see these kind of images popping up again and again over his career in different aspects of his work. And of course, um, one of his more famous textiles commissions were the curtains for the then new um, Malmö Konserthuset in 1944, um, of which he designed a range of uh, very exotic and exuberant um, illustrations for the curtains of that, of that um, concert hall. He joined Uppsala Ekebi. Um, it's a period photograph of him with two of his colleagues. One is uh, Ingrid Attenberg. Um, and all reports were that he was well received there and he changed the perception, he, he changed the, not the perception, the, the mood in the, um, in the design studio. And he produced a range of quite remarkable objects, a lot of one-off objects like these monkey vases, which you see from time to time in the auction houses. 
And when I look at these, I see the beginnings of the techniques that he used uh, at Costa with the dentist drill in the 1950s. This, this very kind of sketch-like quality. Excuse me, when did you say one off? Um, well, though each, each vase was unique, so the, because the illustrations on the vases were actually executed by Vicky. Um, again, um, some of the plates and charges and things that he did there were also one-off uh, <coughs> unique objects with illustrations. And, you know, it, it's um, the economy of line that you see in his drawings. He can use a, a minimal amount of line work to um, be very evocative. Um, one of the um, well-known uh, books that he illustrated, he did a series of books um, with this particular author for children. Um, but again, you know, very um, accomplished and simple drawing techniques here in charcoal um, for these books. But then that kind of leads into this lifelong interest in animals and all things exotic. And this is just a selection of some of the um, production and unique objects he did for Uppsala Ekebi in the 1940s from these um, unique kind of objects here of African animals um, to the very famous elephant that um, uh, were produced um, in huge quantities. But also the, um, again as I said in the exhibition, the beginnings of his thinking towards the next stage of glass. They, these kind of fluted vases are picking up on things that he was doing in glass at Oriforce, but also preempting some of the things that he would do at Costa. You know, and of this tall vase, we start to see the beginnings of some of the things that we see in the Colora series. And then the 1950s, he gets to reinvent himself again. So um, a fierce bidding war between uh, Oriforce and, uh, and Custa. Um, in my book, there's uh, translations of all the letters that went back and forth between he and uh, the owner of Oriforce about him coming back to work with them and him declining. But he made a good decision for him because he had autonomy. He was in charge of everything. He could decide pretty much the direction of the glassworks. And, you know, for someone who is, he was almost 50 years of age. So he wasn't a young artist anymore. Um, he had, you know, the world at his feet. Um, and so, you know, the most prolific period of his career begins. And this is one of the uh, Costa catalogues from the mid 1950s. The illustrations by Vicke, again, this economy of line of drawing a glass bowl or a, a vase. And over on the left is one of the quite sort of um, abstract influenced illustrations here of some dancers that are, uh, the illustration exists around the vase. So you get these lovely uh, um, distortions and, and depth to the designs. But for me, um, what I see, the difference between the period at Oriforce and the period at Custa is colour. And he injected so much colour into Custa, it was remarkable. Um, in a variety of techniques that were versions of uh, techniques he'd learnt at Oriforce, um, but in a simplified manner because he had a non-competition agreement that he couldn't repeat any of the things that he had done previously. So just thinking back to that Uppsala Ekebi slide I showed you a little bit a while ago and the blue vase with the lines and you know in the Colora series that of 1950 there are these sorts of similarities. 
you know, colours of the period, these soft pinks and blues, which were very popular in the 1950s. But also um, this interest in what was happening in modern art. And um, the bowl up on the top left hand side is from the Abstractor series. And in lots of ways that was um, tapping into abstract expressionism. We think of um, people like Jackson Pollock uh, and those sorts of action paintings, the splashes of colour, and which was very much um, um, you know, of that period. There's Vicky trying to sort of think, how can we kind of get that same sort of expression in glass? And, um, and he achieved it. And it was through working with and understanding the material and working with the glass artists, uh, the glass blowers, and understanding how the glass threads can be sort of applied as they're blowing the glass to get these moving, dynamic, uh, expressionistic patterns. The Colora series, which um, is, is very much a, um, a Vicky uh, series. Um, this one's not from that series, but these are from early 50s, late 50s. And this is a unique piece from uh, 1957, which is using a simplified kind of version of the aerial technique. And it's not done in the same way. It's, you know, while the glass is being blown, it's, you know, jammed into a, 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 a kind of mold. And then it's, um, so it's, it's not the same process, but he's still trying to use those same ideas and try and get some of the same qualities of reflection and, and, and refraction that the aerial technique <coughs> afforded him in the, in the 1930s. Can I ask you yes. Question. Are all these objects assigned by him? No, okay, so that, that's a really good point. Um, there were unique objects and there were production objects. And what's interesting about the work he did at Costa is that he kind of elevated the production objects to art objects because no two were exactly the same. Even though they were given a, the same serial number and they were supposedly the same height and the same diameter, they were never the same because of the process of the hand blowing. He very rarely signed his pieces individually. Um, there are some that he did, um, particularly the vases from Oriforce. Um, but the Costa, not so much, no. Um, and of course, with glass production, there are test pieces, there are pieces that are not quite of um, high quality, so they end up uh, not being signed at all. So that, and, and with so much Vicke glass out there in the world, there's, there's lots of all of it. It's another um, piece from the Abstractor series of 1951, in the very first Costa catalogue. And again, it, it, it it shows influences from uh, Italian glass. He worked extensively with the glass blower Bengt Heinz, and they visited uh, Venice and Murano to study what was happening at Venini and some of the other uh, factories there. <coughs> Brought some of those ideas back to Sweden, and then they were kind of um, used in a in a, a very different way and a a, a more kind of loose and exuberant and perhaps more Swedish way. These photographs are um, uh, by the famous Swedish photographer Anna uh, Rivkin and uh, these are taken in his villa in Costa um, in the mid-1950s. And this, there he is posing, uh, looking every bit the artist as he ponders um, a drawing. Um, for a painting, which is one of the rare instances where you'll see him in a photograph actually um, around his artwork and not his glass. The Seasons series um, are probably his most known pieces from, and his most sought after objects from the Costa period. Um, 
the trees in fog vase, which started life as a production piece and ended up as a unique piece. Uh, sorry, started off as a unique piece and ended up a production piece. The autumn or Hearst vase started off as a production piece and ended up a unique piece. So again, um, it's reflected in the technique and the difficulty of making um, the vases. No two were the same because it was the, the, the illustration was done in action. And then these were both from early 50s and this one from 1962, the, um, the um, winter vase. Um, very rare, um, not too many in circulation. It was a production piece rather than a unique piece, but very difficult to achieve the blue colour in the glass. And so um, some examples are like this one here, and others are spectacularly beautiful, like um, the one on the left there. This decanter, I was talking in the exhibition about decanters that were for production and decanters that were for um, unique. This is a production piece, uh, a threads decanter from the early 50s. And it's again that kind of Jackson Pollock-esque idea and using um, red, white and um, black um, canes of glass and wrapping them around the, the, hot, um, the hot glass on the blowing pipe to create these random um, expressionistic techniques. This is a, a famous photograph also by Anna Rivkin of Vicky on the, uh, no not by Anna Rivkin, this is by Sten Robit, um, uh, of Vicky on the blowing room floor sketching out a sketch. And you know we look at that and we think it's a stage thing, but no apparently it wasn't a stage thing. Um, and you know the action of working with the glass blower was part of the design process. But then on the other hand, there exist these very detailed drawings in the archives where he's very particular about what is to be done, how big it is, how the colour has to be used, which demonstrate an understanding of the techniques of glass blowing. He reinvented engraved glass at Kuster in the 1950s. Here he is with Torj Kronqvist and in this illustration with um, Rune Strand. Um, different types of engraving. Uh, this is with the engraving wheel, whereas the work that um, Rune Strand is doing is with the dentist drill and that, that stipple technique. And whilst both styles of engraving are uh, infinitely spectacular, it's, they have a different, um, a different kind of expression. And in these two very famous pieces, Washing and Manhattan, again that kind of American influence, he was very successful and very well known in America. They use a combination of those two techniques to great effect. Um, and both of these also illustrate the way that the illustration takes in the entire circumference of the vase. So you get these multiple views, which again is him taking ideas from modern art. If you think about um, Cubist painting and it's kind of multiple perspectives in a, in a flat plane, there were those sorts of ideas happening. Very traditional wheel engraved piece here, which it, this is um, Midsummer Night's Dream from uh, 1960s. And this vase from the 50s, which is a unique piece, um, is, using, is using only the dentist drill in this stipple technique of these figures embracing around the circumference of a vase. The glass block, which was another um, Another invention that wouldn't have happened without the dentist drill. So instead of engraving on the glass, you engrave in the glass. And these uh, bears are actually um, 
dug out of the glass with, with the dentist drill. Just like a dentist will get in there and sort of drill out the cavity, they make the cavity in the glass. Hugely successful, popular, sold in huge quantities around the world. And possibly the reason why a lot of art critics started to lose interest in his work because they were seen as being these populist, everyman objects that um, had limited artistic value. They're accomplished in terms of the techniques. Uh, if we think about it today from a sustainable kind of perspective, we're using waste from one type of glass production to produce something else. So it's actually a very modern idea for the time of 19, you know, 1951. Um, again, sort of going back to those Bronze Age illustrations, these ones in this drawing are from the Orifice archive. So they're from the 1930s. And these two objects are from the early 1950s at Costa. So again, you know, there's these themes, heavily worked, um, vase that is cut and then it's um, sandblasted to get these kind of icy techniques. But also um, his application of other ways of using glass, a choker for a, and some earrings for a lady, um, never went into production as far as I know. Um, but what's lovely about this drawing is the economy of line. Just a few lines, the red lips, and it's very evocative of, um, almost like a fashion designer might use um, drawing. That application of illustration um, to the way that he uh, engraved glass here with Madonna. There's Vic at his first debut exhibition at Encore in Stockholm in 1951 uh, with another of his engraved pieces. So it's, it's just to illustrate the range of his work. This is Bonnier's, the now defunct famous department store in New York that sold um, exclusively Scandinavian objects, and Vic had a number of exhibitions there over the years. His interest in fish was constant in both an abstract manner, here these little cut fish, school of fish in a fishnet, through to more obvious and of course Yona, which we saw a little earlier. <coughs> Here's some of the sculptures that you'll see in the exhibition outside, um, alongside some of the influences. This one is in the exhibition outside. Um, this is a piece by Henry Moore from the 1940s. Uh, some Henry Moore sculptures, some, some of Vicks. So it, it's showing this uh, interest in what's happening. Uh, again, some Barbara Hepworth at the bottom here, and some of the Vicke objects from the same period um, that are not just, you know, replicating what she's doing, but they're tapping into ideas that um, were coming from surrealism and, and uh, an Italian glass during that period. And the 1960s is where the invention continued. It's uh, polyoptic sculptures. Um, it was also happening in the Czech Republic at the time, but using the refractive qualities and reflective qualities of glass to um, kind of extend the narrative. His interest in sculpture, but he continues with the, the kind of experimentation in coloured glass and some of the more abstract influences from the previous decade. But production glass and well-selling production glass was also um, part of his capabilities in these two um, well-known series, Calypso and Mambo from the 1960s. Patina, we saw some objects uh, in the exhibition outside. 
um, from the mid 60s, Vicke responding to what was happening in design and trying to reinvent himself to be less precise. And then finally in 1969, he had his last exhibition as a Costa artist. He was given free reign by Eric Rosen, the managing director of Costa, to do whatever he wanted. One last exhibition, let's see how it goes. So we had all these, it's almost like a, a retrospective of ideas that he, everything that he'd ever done, he kind of injected those ideas into his uh, glass for the exhibition. There were these pieces that um, use cutting and color. On the previous slide, these sort of more um, totems and there was lots of uh, Mexican and African influences. And this is the exhibition in, um, Encore in Stockholm in 1969. Wasn't very successful, unfortunately, because um, in lots of ways, trends had moved on and people were interested in different things. People like Eric Hergland were um, sort of doing things. Again, his attention turned to painting and then finally to um, public sculptures. And these are some studies he was doing for um, Legend in Glass in the 19, there's some um, paintings from the 1950s and this one's called Glass Folk. It's a, a sculpture that never was never realized. And of course um, a couple of the um, predecessors to uh, Legend in Glass in uh, Nershoping and Umeå, is that right? Yes. Um, the 1970s, Studio Glashitten, um, again using, this, this piece is actually engraved by Vicke, using the dentist drill, um, but still kind of, no longer at Costa, he'd left, but still active in exploring ideas with glass. And then of course, finally, Legend in Glass, um, finally got um, uh, located in, in the, 70s. So that's kind of a, a snapshot of the career of Vicky. Um, there's more um, that you can read in my book and there'll hopefully be more to come in the future. So thank you for coming along today and listening and uh, any questions please let me know. Okay, well thank you very much. <laughs>